Welcome to Community Roundtable. I'm Nick Burns from the Salt Lake Community College Communication Department, and I'm your host as we explore topics of special interest and concern to the residents of all the cities and all the unincorporated areas of Salt Lake County. Topics that we believe are equally important to the general public throughout all the state of Utah. And today, the topic is water. We all know that old saying, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. But hey, here in Utah, we don't have water everywhere, and we are thirsty. That's been the story of the West since the first white settlers arrived. There's not enough water, and what water there is, who gets it, and for what use, that's been and is a matter of ongoing debate. So today, on Community Roundtable, we look at the history and the future of water here in Utah. Joining us today, Spencer Blake is a professor of sociology at Salt Lake Community College, and also with us on Community Roundtable today, Boyd Clayton. He is deputy state engineer at the Utah Division of Water Rights, and thank you for joining us. So, Boyd, I'll start with you here. Governor Herbert just recently rejected this pact over the Snake Valley water. So real quickly, what would have that created had we gone along with it? If we had signed the agreement, what it did was divided the waters of Snake Valley, which has this, a state boundary through it, so it's part of it's in Nevada and part of it's in Utah. It would have defined how much of the water in Snake Valley could be appropriated in Nevada under their water right law and how much could have been appropriated in Utah. So what are we talking about in terms of amounts? Um, and, and that was the interesting part of the agreement. There was a, a study done by the United States Geologic Survey, which ended in about 2007, that tried to look potentially at how much water could be uh, sustainably used, what the recharge was to the valley and the discharge, and they guessed that there was about 132,000 acre feet of water that comes into and leaves Snake Valley every year. So, so can we put that in terms that would mean something to me trying to water my lawn? Um, I mean, that sounds more. like a lot of water. Lot. It, it is a lot of water. Uh, Deer Creek Reservoir holds, I believe, about 150,000 acre feet. So it's a little... About that amount of water then. Yeah. Okay. And the idea was the two states could split it. You know, take that much water without causing, what, environmental destruction? Was no, the idea? There, no, the agreement didn't do that. It just put a th responsibility for the states to manage that only that that was an upper limit to their water. Okay, and it, so the, the agreement wouldn't have had anything to do with where the water would go or whether agriculture or cities would get it. It would just be, here's Nevada, you deal with this much, and Utah, you deal with this much. That's correct. Okay. Th there were some other limitations, one of them being that because state boundaries play into state water right laws, uh, there was significant concern that if, because historically, most of the water that has been developed has been used in Utah. And uh, Nevada had some large water right applications that are pending. And so if they approved those applications, there was concern that it could impair water right uses in Utah. And so okay. part of the agreement was were provisions to simplify the ability of water right users in Utah to access the legal system in Nevada. Okay, so Sp Spencer, bring you in. This was an agreement between Nevada and Utah. Correct. Do we have similar type arrangements with other states surrounding us to split up underground water or surface water? Uh, there's always uh, agreements, but uh, the biggest issue that they're seeing is this. Uh, they're, uh, uh, from Nevada to Utah, uh, we're uh, what we call a uh, uh, cold uh, desert where uh, down in uh, Vegas, it's a, a hot desert. And so they have different types of uh, uh, wa water issues that they have to okay. deal with. So that would see the biggest issue I could see. And, and I mean, Nevada's very dry, not a lot of rainfall. Mm -hmm. We're pretty dry, not it's, a lot of rainfall. Uh, uh, Nevada is the uh, dry, driest, and uh, Utah's the second driest in the state. And how about the United States? Many of all the states, yes. Yeah. So we seem to still consume a lot of water though. Uh, more, Utah has far more uh, usage for laws, or on your lawns mm -hmm. and your uh, uh, education than Nevada. Nevada. Huge difference. Nevada had so little water, they've had uh, far more uh, programs 
to uh, uh, conserve water. Okay, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. So, Boyd, with Snake Valley here, the water's underground. We're talking about an aquifer. So real quickly, for folks who don't know, an aquifer, an underground lake, basically? Well, you can think of it an under, as an underground lake. It's a little more complicated in that there are soils and it's actually water in the pore spaces between the soil particles. Okay. Or, so. or in rock, in the fractures in the rock. More like an underground swamp. Maybe. <laughs> so how, how big are we talking about? I mean, this underground aquifer is much bigger than just the Snake Valley. Yes. Well, the aquifer that originally was targeted by these applications in Nevada uh, is called the Carbonate Aquifer, and it extends through most of western Utah and a, and a good portion of Nevada, south uh, eastern and southwestern Nevada. Okay, and, and this one arrangement to, to share or to divvy up, I guess, this water is actually part of a much larger deal that Nevada wants to do to, to drain from many other parts of the state, if I understand, right? They that's want to pump from all over to Vegas. That's correct. They filed applications in 1989 to divert water, groundwater, from six basins in Nevada, Snake Valley being one of the one six. Of them. And the other five doesn't were not impacted uh, yeah. directly. Well, Snake Valley is the only one that has a, sn a state line through the middle of it. The okay. others were all wholly in Nevada. Interesting. Even though if it's all the same aquifer, I would think it gets kind of dicey with whose water molecules are whom's and where do they flow to. Yes. Very good. This is Community Roundtable talking with Boyd Clayton from the, from the Utah Division of Water Rights and also with us Spencer Blake. He's a professor of sociology here at Salt Lake Community College. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we'll continue talking about water, what's on the surface, what's underground, and what are we going to do with it. Keep it tuned. on Community Roundtable talking about the issue of water here in the Intermountain West. And Boyd, it seems to me that, you know, the states here in the West have done this before. We've had the Colorado River Compact dating back decades now. Uh, but my understanding is Nevada's kind of used their water up? Yes. Uh, we, we have several other compacts that Utah is a party to, one on the Bear River, and a big part of our state is covered by the Colorado River Compact. Uh, that's among seven basin states. Uh, and, and, and Nevada's using their water up completely from that compact already? Yes, or almost entirely. Almost they, have, they have a 300,000-foot 300, foot allocation under the compact, and they are diverting under the terms of the Colorado River Compact, you, you count the water by depletion. And so mm. They can use the mo water more than once, so they can use the water, treat it, put it back into Lake Mead, withdraw it again, take credits for what they put back, and so they actually divert more than 300,000 acre feet a year in that arrangement. So Spencer, they're, Nevada's doing this, right? They're using yeah. the water, cleaning it, putting it back, using it again. And, they, and, and uh, it looks like the, the, the numbers show you it's probably uh, 17 times uh, cycle. What's that doing for like water pollution, I wonder? How clean is it when they put it back and use it again and again? Uh, you know, not. <laughs> I think, I don't, I, I, that I couldn't answer. Yeah. But I do know that when uh, Steve Wynn wanted the uh, uh, tre Treasure Isle Island area mm -hmm. and he wanted uh, clean water or not gray water, uh, Nevada said no, absolutely. And they, so that whole uh, uh, Treasure ocean Island is, is now gray water. Gray water, correct. So I wonder if the actors know that when they have to fall off the ships every night <laughs> and whatnot. Very interesting. So 
you know, Boyd, you were part of negotiating this agreement. You know, it's been going on for years, and, and Governor Herbert just said no. Were you surprised when he said no? Um, no, because I knew that he had apprehensions because of local concern. And so it was a difficult issue for him to decide, and I think he tried to think through it carefully, and, and, and he was very deferential to local input, and I understand that. So tell me about some of those local concerns. Um, locally, the people, for obvious reasons, just don't want any possibility of Nevada building this project, and they looked at the agreement as possibly enabling it. And so uh, they were opposed from that standpoint. They thought the best thing to do was fight to the death, and they still feel like that. Water, them's fighting words here in the West. Um, the concerns being that even if you took water from the aquifer, the ranching and whatnot on the surface would suffer. That's the idea, I suppose? Um, well, they look at it as they're competing to use the water because they pump groundwater in Snake Valley or they use water from springs. and. Uh, if more people pump water, there will be impacts to the aquifer, and they were fearful that the water will flow towards money. And that's mm. one thought, but there's another concept that they always feel is the, uh, in uh, Utah we have what the uh, prior appropriation, where if you've already if you got the first if you've got the first person who used water and used it for uh, a good purpose, it's, you get 100% of that right uh, for the rest of your life. You can't change. If you get 50% uh, uh, drought comes down and you don't have, you get 100%. You still get your water. So what happens is, what happens if Utah's not using all their stuff right now, they worry about, well, since you didn't use it, you'll lose it for the rest of your Lifetime. And, and that's a distinction here in the West that we should make clear that, that water rights here are prior appropriation water. That, Like you said, once you have a right to use it, it's yours. Unlike if folks grew up back East or in common law in England, right? right. If the creek flowed through your farm, you could, it was yours to do what you right. wanted. Mm -hmm. And the next people, it's their problem. Very different here in the West. So much different. Very interesting. Okay, good. Flows towards money. Um, that seems to be what happens, the, that the agricultural side loses out and the money's in the cities and that's where the water seems to go? Well, definitely over time. I mean, that's going to be our future in Utah if we're going to develop new uses that require water. There isn't new water, and so water's going to move from one use to another. Yeah. So cities like San Diego, I think, already do this kind of gray water. They have double pipes under the cities, so you know, gray water for your lawn and clean water for the kitchen and so on. Do you see that coming to Utah? Um, I don't know if we will do gray water, but there already are laws on the books and there are some cities that have implemented uh, wastewater treatment and reuse. Okay. So. And, and how about the recent laws that were passed, I guess, a year ago to allow people to collect their own water in Utah? And uh, I mean, that's something that's pretty new here. Well, new in a one way, very old in another. It, that's what was done when the pioneers first moved here. Good point. And there's a reason they're not doing it anymore. Tell me that. We have more reliable water systems. It wasn't a reliable supply. Yeah, and again, how much can you store? Yeah. So this whole this whole Snake Valley Aquifer and, and this whole in, entirely huge project we were just talking about, my understanding is they don't, the Nevadans that is, don't have any plans to store any water. They're not building reservoirs, they just want to pump it. And to me that seems yeah. kind of odd. What about drought years? Well, in, in their mind, the aquifer is their storage reservoir. And mm. so... Uh, that's what that's one of the purposes of this project or one of the ways they might use it is to augment during dry years okay that is the reservoir go and ahead we worry about what happens is if you uh, look what happened to the uh, Owens uh, Valley where it's just a dust bowl and uh, people in both uh, sides in Nevada and Utah worry that if we pump the uh, dry light or dry it will just be uh, dust. Right, Owens Valley was the valley completely destroyed by pumping the water down to LA oh, yeah. 
and there were you know expl dynamitings of the canals and whatnot originally dating right. back to the 30s. D do those fears seem valid that that Snake Valley could end up in Owens Valley? Um, I don't believe so, but there are people who fear that. I think they're very different situations. Uh, Owens Valley had a large freshwater lake. That's where most of the dust problems are coming from, is that lake. They, has, right, they has took the surface up. water. Yeah. yeah. There is no real surface water to speak of in Snake Valley. So, and I have to ask about another project too, and, that, and we've heard so much about this here in Utah, and that's the whole pipeline to St. George from the Colorado. I presume that's water that we already have appropriation rights for? That's correct. Under the Colorado River Compact, okay. that's water we're entitled to. So the question is, where do we want to put that water from the Colorado when we want it? That's correct. And so any way to compare those two projects, the Snake Valley Aquifer Project and this pipeline, or different kettles of fish? Well, I, I think they're exactly the same kettle in one mm -hmm. respect. Yeah. They're large uh, metropolitan areas that want and need more water and they're water. looking to the sources where they can get it. Okay, very good. This is Community Roundtable. We'll be right back. Talk more with Boyd Clayton from uh, Division of Water Rights for the State of Utah and also Spencer Blake from the Sociology Department here at the college. I'm Nick Burns. We'll be right back. Keep it tuned. Salt Lake Community College, your place to step ahead. Step ahead, that's another way to say, become successful. It means to move forward. There are a lot of ways to find success at Salt Lake Community College, but what has helped me the most is my academic advisor. Is Jay Garcia available? Sure, do you know where his office is? Yes. Yes, he's ready for you. Great, thanks. College is such an important step, but when you're not sure what career to choose, what to major in, or what classes to take, an academic advisor can be your best friend. Hi, Jay. Hi, Heather. How's it going? Good, thanks. Can we talk about careers I can explore? Of course, have a seat. We help students by looking at the different careers that they might, uh, might want to pursue. We also look at uh, the catalog and the courses that students well, we'll need to take for the specific major. Other things that we do is if a student is getting ready to transfer to another institution, we help them make that transfer a little bit more easy. Sometimes we help students make sure they don't take classes that they don't really need for their program and save them some money and time. Academic advising has been very beneficial to me. I would recommend that every student at Salt Lake Community College contact an academic advisor. It will save so much time and trouble down the road if they can talk to the academic advisor early on in their education. Thanks, Jay. Have a good one. Awesome! Step Ahead just took on a whole new meaning. For hours and campus locations of Salt Lake Community College advising offices, go to www.slcc.edu forward slash academic advising. We are back on Community Roundtable talking about water here on the state in the state of Utah. Water above the ground, water below the ground. What are we going to do with it? Who's going to get to drink it? And Spencer, one thing that comes to mind, we were just talking about the pipeline, the potential pipeline and the inordinate cost of that, billions right. and billions of dollars. And it seems to me that at one point there was actually an agreement that Senator Reid from Nevada was going to earmark some money for Utah. But that fell apart, he correct? Was, they were going to try to uh, have both of us have concerns. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, uh, combine our concerns. Uh, but in the end, Utah said, no, you're taking all the water. Uh, and we already have access to that water. We just don't have the funds as well as we'd enjoy. So that that deal fell apart. Yeah, well, uh, it's still in uh, uh, you know, you know, in negotiations. Committee? Right so now. negotiations somewhere yeah. or other. But things shut down. Uh, what in two thousand seven? It really oh, years shut ago. down. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this this whole Snake Valley in tapping the aquifer and dividing it up, and again, as you said, Boyd, this isn't necessarily how much water would be pumped to any given area. It's just each state would have control of what to do with it. Um, the, the couple of articles that, that looked at this in the Salt Lake Tribune recently with Governor Herbert's decision to say no talked about safeguards 
that would that would be used to determine that if and when that water was used it wouldn't be damaging and I know you just said the folks down in Snake Valley didn't support those but I wonder what tell me about those safeguards what, what does that mean exactly um, there were uh, a series of safeguards that were built into the agreement one set of safeguards was that the two states agreed that we would not uh, appropriate more water or use more water than was sustainable in the valley so that as each state continued to appropriate we would monitor uh, the uses and monitor how the system responded and if we found that what was happening was that we were mining water both states would cut back uses based on priority because we're both prior appropriation states. So tell me about that monitoring what does that mean? I mean how does that work? How, what, how you do it is that uh, obviously people who divert water, you put meters to measure how much water they're using, and then you drill wells to monitor the water levels in the basin. So you can see how those water levels are changing as you pump the water. And there would be a, what, a threshold that if the level in that well dropped below a certain amount, then people would have to back off or pump less? Correct. So some of the arguments against this whole deal that I heard on the Utah side were um, by the time, this is the Great Basin Water Network, said by the time the wells dropped and the monitoring showed a problem, their argument was it would be too late for the Snake Valley already. Does that make sense? Um, in, in one sense, and what they were concerned about is there are also some springs and wet areas, uh, and another provision of the protections is we have some sensitive species that are in the West Desert, uh, the leashed chub and, and the Columbia spotted frog. And so part of the agreement were protections to make sure those two species didn't become listed as endangered species. And, and, and are those just in Utah or is that a Nevada issue as uh, well? It's, it's more of an issue in Utah. It's also an issue okay. in Nevada, but it's more of an issue in Utah. And uh, so part of the agreement was monitoring those springs uh, and those uh, environmental issues so that they wouldn't become endangered. And, uh, and that was the concern is the springs would run dry and, and to some extent that's true. Once the spring runs dry it's too late. In order to get the water levels back it could take years. Or, yeah, it could take decades. Yeah. I mean the, these folks, the Great Basin Water Network, I mean they flat out called this whole deal a water grab by Nevada. Does that track, do you think? Well, it depends on your point of view. I, it's two <laughs> depends if you're in Nevada. Yeah. Yeah it's, yeah. it's two states trying to solve a water issue, and uh, and we obviously don't want them to use our water, and they don't want us to use their water. Yeah. So whose water is it? Yeah, and it's a community resource. It's actually everybody's water. But I can't help but think of this whole split between you know Las Vegas and Salt Lake City. That you know, that, you know, who's who's got a better use for the water in terms of in terms of their cities? Um, I wonder in this negotiation that you were in that came to this agreement that you know possibly there'll be more negotiations. Um, were the native peoples involved, the Goshutes, and any of the tribes? Were they were they in on this? Um, the there were no Native Americans involved in the negotiations. There was a local resident from. Snake Valley that was part of the negotiating team. His name's Dean Baker. Okay. Because a couple years ago I had the chance to talk to Rupert Steele who used to be the president of the Confederated Tribes and they were very concerned that uh, that this whole entire deal, not just the Snake Valley Aquifer and this shared deal, but all of this pumping in Nevada would just decimate his tribal waters. Uh, you know, and his tribe, I mean their reservation is over by the Great Basin Park and all. So. I wonder, are there hard feelings between, you know, Nevada and Utah when, you know, the white culture is dividing up the water and the native folks aren't at the table, so to speak? Uh, they clearly had concerns and that was an issue. Um, we looked at the issue and the Goshute Reservation actually is in a separate valley, Deep Creek Valley, to the north of Snake Valley. And uh, as we looked at the hydro hydrology and the issues, we can, were convinced in our mind before it ever became an issue to their water resource, it would be so bad in Snake Valley that we would have reversed course. And okay. so, so we didn't see it as an issue, but the Goshutes clearly did. Probably did, yeah. And this is the confederated tribe of the Goshutes, right? Because there's two different reservations for people to be clear. Um, 
Moving forward, are, are you going to be part of the next round of negotiations, do you know? I mean, what's next here? We don't know what's next, frankly. Uh, the governor, uh, Governor Herbert, uh, clearly left the door open to talk about this more if Nevada wants to. Whether they do that or do something else, we don't know. Uh, court? Um, it, there's several options Nevada could pursue, and we don't know which yeah. one they'll follow. I mean, it's obviously, they don't need our permission to develop water in their state. It, it's in their state. They could just move ahead and develop the resource. They could just pop a well in the ground and start going and worry about it later, even if the water comes from under the Utah side of the border. The one thing that uh, uh, Senator Bennett, uh, when they were looking at that, he uh, passed uh, on a, fed, a federal law that says you, can, you have to uh, con con control, uh, you have to see the whole system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Senator Bennett, he uh, uh, helped us for Utah. I extremely. mean, it's a macro view, not a micro mm -hmm. view. That's right. I mean, because to me, that would be the concern. Nevada will just, we want the water anyway. Las Vegas needs it. Eventually, it'll start growing again. Then what? <laughs> and, and there is a public law, Public Law 108. 424 called the Lincoln County Land Act that was initiated by Senator Reed and Senator Bennett was able to get language inserted in that yeah. bill that required an agreement between the two states before any groundwater with, was withdrawn from base and shared between the states. Nevada has asserted from the beginning that that gave Utah more sovereignty than they had. Interesting. Uh, and yeah. so likely there's a constitutional issue if Utah tried to push uh, that provision. We're back so. in the Supreme Court eventually. Yeah. Very yes. good. We're going to have to leave it there. So I if you continue with these negotiations, best wishes. I know we're all thirsty and there's only so much water. So Boyd Clayton, thank you very much for taking time to be with us. Spencer Blake, thank you. Thank you. Again, water, an ongoing issue that we aren't going to solve here today, but thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us on Community Roundtable. If you have comments, if you have questions, or you have suggestions for future programs, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out. You can email us at roundtable at slcctv.com. Simple enough. Drop us an email. Thanks again, Boyd Clayton and Spencer Blake. And I'm Nick Burns. Keep it tuned to SLCC TV. Mm -hmm.